right, welcome everybody. If you're just joining, my name is Ellie Johnston. I'm here with uh, Janet and Danielle on our team. We are calling in from the US, but uh, we will get to see and hear from our team at COP27 um, in just a few. Uh, the, so the way this is gonna work is uh, because of the internet issues, at Sharm El Sheikh and at COP27. Uh, they're not able to join the Zoom, our Zoom webinar live today, um, but they have sent us videos and pictures. So we're gonna give you all an on the ground look at what it's like at COP27 right now. Uh, I'm pretty excited about this because it's uh, totally different than what we normally do. I know uh, many of you all, I see some a lot of familiar names uh, joining us today. Hello, hello, and welcome. Um, so we are the team that creates En-ROADS, and uh, we have three people from our staff team at COP27 right now using En-ROADS, running tons and tons of different events, and, as well as several of our En-ROADS climate ambassadors that are there as well, um, many of them longtime partners who have also been running En-ROADS events at COP27. Um, we have some videos uh, from them, so I'll show that in just a minute, and we'll be able to hear from and, and also see uh, what it's like at COP27. Um, after the kind of series of clips and images we have, then we have a very special opportunity, and we will watch um, a good portion of a session that's happening right now in Egypt at COP27 at the US State Department's pavilion. So one of the things at the climate negotiations is that many countries have these um, pavilions, these areas where they are able to run events and give presentations, feature scientists and experts on all different topics speaking. And um, Drew Jones from our team, as well as uh, the, the others that are there are talking right now to a group of uh, representatives from different countries, civil society members that are at COP, and we're going to get to watch that uh, in the second part of this webinar today. So you'll hear less from me, uh, more. For, we'll just sit back and enjoy the clips, the sounds, what's happening on the ground at COP. Um, we do have the chat open, so you're welcome to, we'll keep an eye on that. Also, if you have specific questions, um, feel free to write them into the questions box and we'll get to them as we can. Uh, but mostly I'm excited to, to hear from our team over in Egypt. Welcome everybody. It's so excited to see the, the wide range of different people uh, coming in from everywhere. I see people from Nepal, Lebanon, San Diego, California, Maryland, Germany, Lebanon, Wisconsin. Peru, and that's just a few of you all. Um, okay, so I'm gonna share my screen now and we're gonna watch a series of different video clips and images uh, taken over the last 48 hours at the COP27 negotiations uh, with, from our team. Hey there, this is Drew and Florian in Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt for COP27. First thing in the morning. Ellie, it sounds to me like the sound cut out there. Again. Yeah, and it sounds like for and other people too. they are going to, to their back. events, for example, over here in the side event, side event okay. and then but here in these delegation halls where there are many booths and pavilions of the different stakeholders yeah. you're presenting here. Yeah, good morning from COP, everybody. Hi, everybody. This is Yasmine. Hi, we're here at COP27. Uh, we just ran a couple of end roads events today, one at the Children and Youth Pavilion. It was really cool showing end roads to 
uh, a lot of youth activists really enjoyed the different dynamics and the different insights that Emirates had to offer. And we also ran an event in the Colombia Pavilion. It was great to connect with leaders in the region. We had a great discussion with Enroads, with people from Colombia, Chile, that had been at Roy before. And yeah, they just loved Enroads and the discussions were great. And we're currently at the Children and Youth Pavilion. You can hear behind us a lot is happening, so we just wanted to show you around a little bit. Here's the conversation that I hear over in the negotiating halls, which are just right over there. Uh, groups saying, hey, China, you're now a major emitter. All the coal that you're developing uh, into the future, you should be part of financing climate uh, adaptation around the world. You should be financing investment and mitigation around the world. Spend the money that you have. And they're saying, well, no way. We... <laughs> future emitters, but what about the past emitters? Historical emissions from US and EU. Not until they pay should we be involved in this. And in India, South Africa, Indonesia, fast growing future emissions places saying, we want clean energy. We need financing. Show us the money. There was a guy from India who literally showed the clip from the Jerry Maguire movie. Show me the money. Global South, much of Africa, Asia, South America, saying, show me the money. How about loss and damage? Paying for dealing with all the climate change that is here. Then it turns over to the US and the EU, where I witnessed them even not even agreeing to define what climate finance is in some of the negotiations. Perhaps it seems as a way to avoid facing the music about that check being, that bill being passed to the US EU saying your historic emissions are the greatest. You, me, I'm from the US, have caused most of this problem. So you should be paying for loss and damage and adaptation. Countries, US and EU willing to cut their own emissions, Inflation Reduction Act, fit for 55, these uh, internally actions to address mitigation. Four groups going around and around in text now for the 27th year in a row. And as much as I'm positive about action, sometimes it's just heartbreaking to hear the same conversations year after year. I've got to be honest. Sometimes people, sometimes my friends, it's just heartbreaking. This is Juliet Rooney Varga. Um, just want to build a little bit off of what Drew has already shared with you. Um, also want to say, I start off by saying I definitely agree with his takeaways. Um, I think a few notes and contrasts of things that I'm seeing. First, just want to say that the side events and civil society meetings that we're seeing here are as inspiring as ever. Um, I'm also breathing a sigh of relief as an American that we're rep well represented here, engaged, we're moving climate action forward back in the US, so that feels really good. And also the negotiations aren't over, so I think there's still, um, still want to hold hope that things could look better tomorrow or Saturday or maybe even Sunday, um, but they don't look so great now. This year's COP feels a lot less focused than last year's at COP26. It just feels like there's not a clearly clear articulated vision that everyone's moving forward together on in the negotiations. The key goals that I'm hearing about are definitely to bring loss and damage into the negotiations. And then there's this idea of, you know, goal for implementation. But what people mean by implementation seems to be far from clear. Um, on loss and damage or a mechanism for wealthy nations who've caused most of historical emissions and therefore have caused most of current climate impacts, um, the idea is that they should be compensating developing nations who have contributed little historically, but who are disproportionately bearing the impact of climate change. And I think that people are saying it would be fair for the Egyptian presidency to claim some success just for the simple reason that loss and damage is being discussed at all um, in the negotiations. 
But while it is certainly being discussed a lot, it's very contentious. And from what I'm hearing, there is no agreement about a formal facility or a formal mechanism for handling loss and damage finance, or even what, what it means, what a definition of loss and damage is. Um, you know, developed countries don't want to include words like compensation or liability. And one negotiator told me that while there are a few countries who have put millions of dollars on the table, which is really, you know, orders of magnitude, it's a tiny amount of money instead of the billions or even trillions that are needed, um, none of them are willing to link that funding to climate disasters. So instead, they're linking it to things that are clearly not connected to climate change, like natural disasters, like earthquakes or something, because to be held responsible for the full impact of climate change is um, probably just too overwhelming. I'm also hearing it, frankly, talked about as a bit of a distraction from the discussions on mitigation, because it seems very unlikely that any agreement will be reached on loss and damage. And meanwhile, there's not as much talk about mitigation. There was a draft of the cover decision text released today. Um, it's it's far longer than normal. It's on the order of 20 pages when it should be something like two pages. And while comments from negotiators are varied on it, like depending on where they're coming from in the climate conversation, um, they all seem to agree that the text is unfocused, unstructured, and lacks a shared vision. So that doesn't really bode well for what's coming next. So I guess where does that leave me? Um, I think those of us who work in climate change, it's pretty common to have a real array of mixed feelings um, where we kind of sit with that. And I think on the one hand, we're learning about incredible, innovative, and inspiring climate action here at COP. One example that really hit home for me was a collaboration between Israelis, Palestinians, and Jordanians on climate change education in the Gaza Strip um, and also water purification in those areas. And another inspiring or just one that excited me was a Nigerian delegate who was eager to work um, to work with me to connect youth in the, in the U.S. Uh, to African delegates here to do a better job reaching our policymakers. So I guess the good news is that we're all going to go home and build more momentum, whether or not the negotiators get their act together. Thanks. In particular, when we look at climate change education, we're dealing with something quite complex problem. How do we help people understand something that's so complex and dynamic? We know that people are coming to this problem not as blank slates, but with prior misconceptions often, and that can be difficult, make it difficult. End of the day here in COP27. I thought I would just show a little bit of what the pavilion looks like on the inside. All of these booths, all of these people working on different things. I'm next to Israel. Right there behind me is the U.S. Center where we're giving our talk. It's sustainable development goals behind me. Tens of thousands of people coming together. The earth responding to the challenge to its sustainability by pulling humans together to collaborate and try to solve this problem. Some are collaborating on mitigation, on adaptation, on loss and damage, financing to address justice. Some are fighting us. There are hundreds of fossil fuel representatives who are disrupting a lot of what's going on um, and proposing small solutions. Some of them helping. Uh, pretty challenging times. Here's the Center for Mobility. There's Indonesia, South Africa. People you know, walk by. There's like a lot going on here in Japan. I don't know what's about the deal is, but you can see a big event and a lot of people clustered around Japan. Overall, pretty inspiring to be part of all of these folks. Many of them are working together to make it happen, do all that we can.
I'm missing the audio again here on this video. All right, everyone. I hope that gives you a sense for what uh, it's like on the ground at COP27, and you got to hear a little bit of an update there from members of our team on what they're hearing from the negotiations, what they're seeing. Um, of course, there are tons of uh, news articles flying uh, about what's happening in the negotiations. We're seeing uh, con some countries starting to make movements towards um, supporting a big phase out of fossil fuels. That's another thing that I've been reading about um, and would be really great to see more momentum around. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a busy kind of messy process um, that, and here we are many, many years into it, as you heard from Drew. Um, sometimes it feels like the conversations are, are quite familiar and, um, and yet sometimes too, we see some breakthroughs. Um, so now I'm going to switch over to a uh, the um, live stream of the team in Egypt, uh, many of whom you just heard from. They are at the U.S. Center, so one of those pavilions that you saw in the video, um, presenting En-ROADS and sharing about that. And we won't have time to, to listen to the whole thing. We'll share the link. Um, it's It's on YouTube. And uh, you can go back and, and uh, watch the whole thing if you want. But we'll take the, this will take us to the top of the hour. And um, but we'll be on chat and uh, can can cover um, any questions that we can answer. And so not not all these questions we can answer too. Um, so over to my screen. Really happy that you're here. Um, this is going to be pretty cool. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be running a simulator that's going to allow you all to make suggestions about how to address climate change. And then you're going to very quickly see the results here in this simulator. My name is Andrew Jones. I am the co-founder and executive director of Climate Interactive, and I'm a research affiliate at MIT Sloan and work with the sustainability initiative there. This is my colleague, Yasmin Zahar, who's going to be flying En-ROADS with me here today. And just to give you a taste of what we're doing, uh, here's how fast it is. So what we've been doing, here's the simulator En-ROADS, and just a test of its speed. What if we have a lot of transport energy efficiency? You notice that blue line go down. It's going to very quickly show what is the impact of actions that you propose that we hope add up to get us to well below two degrees. And it's going to be an interactive exercise. Are you ready to roll up your sleeves a little bit? Yeah? Okay. This should be fun. Before I get going, just a little context about the State Department and just to, some gratitude to the State Department, Andrew Moffitt. You open the door for this. Give it up for Andrew. He's been organizing these things with you guys for two weeks of these things. This is the last one. We are the anchor sprinter. We're going to bring you home. But you guys didn't bring us home as a State Department. You set us up. I was a student at MIT in the 90s, and all the models that were climate models around the world took like three days or a week to run. You had any question about anything, you had to wait three days, find $50,000, have a research study, wait for it to be published six months later. No offense, scholars, we love you, but you're slow. We needed faster tools. And some of the State Department people at that time, Jonathan Pershing, Todd Stern, White House Science Advisor, John Holder for President Obama, shaped our simulators, building up to Copenhagen, 2009, 
we were there and John Holdren came to us. That was a big deal for a young nonprofit. John Holdren said, President Obama is coming in 48 hours and I can't answer a question and I need an answer. Should I tell President Obama it is better to ask the Chinese government to peak their emissions five years earlier in 2025 or one gigaton lower, not around 15, but around 14. Okay, everyone do that in your heads. Five years earlier or one gigaton lower. Can you do it in your heads? No, you need a simulation model and you need one that works very, very fast. We had one, we got the PowerPoint done in two hours. He gave it to President Obama and that was the birth of Climate Interactive in the really big sense. So thank you, State Department. You shaped this and really set us up to be able to contribute to this UNFCCC process. Now, the question today isn't peaking for China. The question today is, hey, what if we do get a lot of carbon capture and storage? What if we do electrify everything? What if we do get a ton of carbon dioxide removal? Those are the kinds of questions we're going to be asking. Folks, if you're in the back, come sit down. There's great chairs. I know there's not enough chairs in any of these pavilions. Come sit down. We need more people to suggest what we're going to be testing here in En-ROADS. Okay, here is the game. We have 52 minutes. Can you create a scenario well below two degrees together? That's gonna be the challenge. First though, I wanna explore some of the things that don't help as much as you think it's being discussed. You know there are these conversations out there. You'll see the headlines, will X save the world? And you know it won't. It isn't that big a deal. So I'd like you to think for a second, what are the ones that get a lot of talk but don't add up to taking this number from 3.6 towards 2 degrees? So start thinking about that, and we're going to drop your suggestions into the context of this simulator. Let me just talk a little bit about En-ROADS and the baseline. Over here, this is where we get all the world's energy. So if you make it really big, Yazzie, this is shows you our assumption. Now, mind you, this is not a forecast. We don't play forecast games. This is a low climate action future. And in this future, 2000 to 2100, we have a lot of coal in brown. We have a lot of oil. We have a lot of natural gas, wind and solar. Do you see that wedge expanding? Wind and solar expanding over time because it's getting really inexpensive. Actually, let's just show that. You can see, yes, if you pull up the marginal cost of electricity production, um, you can see how cheap wind and solar is getting over time. This shows, and this is what's driving the model in many ways, or at least the electricity choices. This shows marginal cost of electricity production, dollars per kilowatt hour. Here we were, this is that beautiful drop that gives us a lot of climate hope. Wind and solar getting so much less expensive, dropping here below coal and below gas as a source of electricity. Because of that, we're getting that expanding wedge of wind and solar in green in that last graph. Put all that together, that's all the CO2 from energy. Add in land use CO2, add in methane, F gases, nitrous oxide. That's all the pollution, greenhouse gas net emissions. See that little bump there? What is the source of that? What's happening right there? Why does it go down a little bit? Yeah, that's the pandemic. That's the COVID, so we added it in there of just like, but it's coming back. Emissions have gone back up. And we expect them in this baseline future to keep going up, put all this together, and you get 3.6 degrees. Now, where do we want to go? This dot, we added up, and so did climate analytics. All of the pledges in the other room from the mitigation work, all of the NDCs, if they're followed, create that red dot right there. But we need to do better than that dot. By 2030, we need greenhouse gas emissions to be how much lower? Killian? 
50%. We need 50%. So that should be down here. We're really aiming here. But it would be great if we could get it to go right through the red dot, okay? Before I asked you, and folks who are in the back, come on and sit down if you want to play this game. I asked you, what are the solutions that get talked about a lot? But in your mental model, when you run the math in your head, you think, you know, that's not going to help that much. Turn to the person next to you, you two, what is on your list? Turn to the people there, you go, Andrew and your friend here, turn to the person behind you. What are solutions that are lower leverage than they are discussed? We really are going to talk to each other. Eduardo, there's a gentleman right here. Good talk to you. Tell him what you think. Tell him what you think. What are things that are lower leverage? You're concerned about that. What's on the list? The activists call it false solutions. I'm going to call them lower priority. Some of them we might need to do. So call out. I need you to do it really loudly. What is one of these lower pro priority solutions? Natural gas. What's another one? Oil. So others. Maybe energy efficiency and transport doesn't do as much as you thought it maybe would do. Others over here on this side. False solutions. Christian Holtz. He's played with the model too much. Say it again. Nuclear. Maybe nuclear. Carbon trading. Yes, in the back. Yeah. Afforestation. Trillion trees. Trillion trees. We heard a lot about trillion trees in the previous U.S. administration. There's a lot of talk of trillion trees. Let's actually go with that one. So run in your head. What if we had a trillion trees? If I went in the center here, not here. If I went to downtown Sharm El Sheikh and interviewed 100 people who knew all about climate change and asked, if we had a trillion trees in the world, how much would temperature go down? Or you went to the Times Square in New York. A trillion trees, 3.6 degrees goes where? How low? Is it a silver bullet? I'm getting a nod in the back. What would temperature be? Trillion trees. So someone call out a number. 3.6 goes where? Does it go to two, two and a half, three, three and a half, 3.2, 2.8? What do you like? Say it again. 3.3. 3.3. Anyone lower? Raise your hand if you're lower than 3.3. Anybody? Yeah? She thinks lower. Okay. We're going to plant a trillion trees on Earth and see what it does. A trillion trees happens to be even more than the maximum in this slider. And by the way, if you like this and you want to do more of it, this model is free online in 18 languages. Yeah, as you pull up those languages, actually, Yazi is the person who coordinated with volunteers all around the world to get these 18 languages. Yeah, yeah, give her a hand. Thank you. Good work, Yazi. Here they all are. We just added Kiswahili and Hindi for a billion people. Not a billion people, but for a lot of people. So try it yourself, but we need more than this allows. So one way that we build confidence in this model, of course, we build it with the best available science. Of course, we use the data from the IPCC and other sources, the IEA. Of course, we compare this model against the other large, disaggregated, integrated assessment models. These are in a suite called the SSPs, Shared Socioeconomic Pathways. They come from Peak in Germany and IASA in Austria. And there's an Asian one, the AIM model, Globium. These are the models that we compare against to make sure that our results are consistent with theirs. But we also make the, many of the parameters available and transparent. So when it comes to trillion trees, you go under assumptions. Let's go look and see under there. If you don't like what you're about to see, you change some assumptions. So down here, we'll pull up afforestation settings. And I think it's going to show you 740, 700 million hectares at the maximum. For a trillion trees, you need 840. I know the number is 840. So if you change that to 840, and we really are gonna make sure it is a trillion, 
And here they come. So click off this and here we go and go. We had a 3.3. We had a hand up for lower than 3.3. And drum roll, please. Here we go. 3.5. It shaved off 0.1 degree. Did it save the world? Did it help? A little bit. That's a lot of trees for only 0.1 degree. Now, let's see. What happened? Why did that happen? Over here on the left, these are we've got the energy, but let's pull up what it does is this is about removals. This is not about cutting emissions. This is about boosting the capacity of the earth to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. So pull up if you would net. You can do it from the there's a shortcut up here where it's really easy to find. Net CO2 removals. This is how much carbon is getting pulled out of the atmosphere with a trillion trees. What, what decade is a trillion trees effective at removing carbon from the atmosphere? Here are the 2020s. Here are the 2030s. Here are the 2040s. It gets going in the 2050s, and it gets serious about pulling out in the 2060s. It takes a little time to find some land, plant some trees. Trees take a long time to get big enough to do significant work through photosynthesis of pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. It's just a long delay. So here's the contribution. Remember what we need to do? We need that red dot. It's way too delayed. It's way too delayed. Now, you may say, oh, what? These guys cooked the books. These guys are anti-tree. We need trees. I love trees. We need more trees for many reasons around biodiversity. They are not a priority for avoiding future warming. And if you think I am anti-tree or something, let's change some assumptions and push it a bit. So under here, under afforestation, what if it doesn't take quite as long to secure the land, not 10 years, but less. So yeah, he's gonna move that down. And what if the planting time isn't 30 years for plant all the trees, but it's much, much less. Notice that, oh, now it's really helping in the 2050s. And now we're down at 3.4 instead of 3.5. Even with varying uncertainty, we see that planting a trillion trees is not a significant contributor to preventing future warming. There are a whole lot of other lower priority efforts. I'm gonna just do one quickly before we move on to the good news. This is the bad news part, right? This is like what's not really gonna help. Do similar math with thorium fission, nuclear fusion. What if we invented, a? oh wait, even before that, what about the equity issues with this? Trillion trees, how much land are we talking about? Who lives on this land right now? Who grows their food on this land right now? So we calculate total land for growing CO2 related bio, biomass, that one right here, up one, yep. This, there it is, we typed in 840 million hectares. This is the area of India. So we used two and a half Indias around the world to plant a trillion trees to cut maybe 0.1. What this is all leading us back to, of course, will be the headline, what is the priority of addressing climate change? In case you're just walking by, we know this, even without this model, of course, it's reducing the burning of coal, oil, and gas, reducing methane, and cutting deforestation. Top five priorities, of course. What's causing climate change? Those five things. What prevents climate change? less of those five things. It's not that hard. Unfortunately, what we find is that research shows that showing people research doesn't work. The scientific community has been saying those are the top five priorities for 25 years, but it doesn't really sink in via PDFs and PowerPoints. That's why we're here because we think you need to push a little bit on assumptions. You need to be engaged in a different way and you need to be a bit more aspirational and really aim for something that you really want to see, not just get the bad news that I've been delivering for the last 10 minutes. Okay, let's keep digging in a little bit. 
equity considerations, because our goal with this work is to address climate change and equity together, okay? But I started teasing you about thorium fission, research and development into a new technology. What if we had a Manhattan kind of project? Manhattan project around the war, send some really smart people into a lab, they figure out thorium fission or cold fusion, and then it saves the world, right? Play it out in your head. What do you think it would do? So he has, if you would undo this, and then we're gonna go over here and you'll see new zero carbon energy. We're gonna bring that in cheaper than coal, cheaper than coal, zero carbon energy. What would it deliver? So turn to the person next to you, say a number. I've already hinted about what this is gonna be. Is it a silver bullet? Two degrees? What number will you see when we invent and spread zero carbon energy? 3.6 goes where? Seriously, turn to someone and say the number. Okay. This is a negotiation. The whole spirit of this is people who don't know each other around the world talking. That is what we want to happen in the other room. Demonstrate it as possible by turning the person next to you and saying a number. I think the temperature will be 2.4, 3.5, 1.9, 2.7. Say a number. Say it to somebody. Okay, now you make an estimate, but you also have to think why, and we want to deliver why, like, well, of course it's helpful. This is zero carbon energy. That's, that's the silver bullet, right? But think the world doesn't need zero carbon energy. It doesn't need, the climate doesn't need wind and solar. It doesn't need any of these zero carbon sources. It needs something that keeps us from burning coal oil and gas. So the capacity to displace the pollutants, that's what a really powerful solution would be about. Okay, so we're going to bring it up and we're going to see how effective is this at avoiding future coal, oil, and gas. All right, here it comes. You said a number, you said a number, boom, 3.4. What does it do? Here it is. It's that orange area on top of the other sources of primary energy. So play it a few more times. It gets initiated. It takes 10 years to commercialize. Uranium-based nuclear took 12. We thought it would be faster. And it starts to displace the other sources and other things shrink. Look at this. See this brown area of coal? Less coal. That reduces emissions. Look at the blue area, less gas. That reduces emissions. How about oil? Looks like oil just kind of moves up and down. It's not really shrinking, but let's go. Well, we can check. Let's go look. Well, no, no, we're not going to look at it. Let's go look and make sure we really got the zero carbon energy. Let's go look at the zero carbon energy, if you would. Here it comes. <sighs> this growth is faster than any source of energy has ever grown in the history of time. So that is very fast growth over time. Okay, confirm that we got it. How did we do? What did we do with coal? So did we really displace coal? Okay, we did displace a lot of coal and overall energy demand is bringing it back over time. It didn't kill it forever. It still is alive and it has a bit of a resurgence. And we got 3.4. Why? Well, once again, in what decade did it really succeed in avoiding coal, oil, and gas? There's that 10-year delay. And if we spend 10 years building coal, oil, and gas infrastructure that lives for 30 years, we have locked into even more carbon producing infrastructure in those years it takes a long time to get rid of the coal oil and gas bring this in so it's just very delayed also why does it spread it spreads around the world because it's cheap if we have cheap energy around the world and let's go look how cheap it is if you hit the thumbnails up here yazzy um over here here's the cost of energy this is kind of cool 
clean energy is cheap energy, and we like that. And yet, what happens to the incentive for energy efficiency and conservation if the energy price goes down a little bit? Let's look at energy demand. What happens to energy demand? Energy consumption is this one way over here. Yep. There's just a little bit of a boost. We call this the price demand feedback loop. Lower prices pushes demand up. That's another impact. Also, we're counting on wind and solar in the future. If we had zero carbon thorium fission, what happens to this dreamy future for wind and solar? Someone with your hands, it was doing that. What's it going to do if we have competition? Yes, Eduardo. Let's go look and see what happens to wind and solar. So renewable, I think it's going to be renewable primary energy consumption over left. In this case, it's going to be, yeah, right there. Look at the blue line. It crowds out the other stuff that we really were counting on. The good is the enemy of the best. These are what we call systems thinking insights. As we design solutions, we need to treat this world as an interdependent whole with many interconnections across the energy system, the land system, the economy, impacts, et cetera. That is one of the key things. So we just saw two lower leverage solutions than you would think. A trillion trees do as much as we had hoped. Thorium fission, nuclear fusion didn't do as much as we would hope. Uh, what would do it? Turn to the person next to you. What would be really high impact? What would be really high impact? Tell the person next to you what we should try next. We got rid of these. What shall we do? Because we need to get well below two degrees. If you're walking by, you can join us. What we're doing is we're testing futures in the En-ROAD simulator. Think, okay, what is high leverage? If not thorium fission, if not a trillion trees, what is powerful? What was that, sir? Other gases, methane and other gases, methane and other gases. Let's look at what happens on the baseline for methane and other gases in our stacked graph. Instead of just this single line, I'd like you to look at all the sources of warming. These are all the greenhouse gases. This is the stuff causing the problem. Can you make it really big? Here we have land use CO2. In, this is deforestation emissions down here in green. This big wedge is burning what three things? Coal, oil, and gas. Thank you. F gases, HFCs. Thank you, Kigali Amendment. Good job, State Department. Kigali Amendment addressing HFCs here. Here's the methane that is the biggest other gas, short-lived forcers. Here, nitrous oxide, mostly from fertilizer. The big highlight last year in Glasgow, of course, the global methane pledge should we bring these down much lower. Okay, how much is it gonna help? Run your mental model there. It doesn't get as much attention as energy. Now, mind you, a lot of the methane does come from energy, from coal, from oil and gas. Let's bring this all the way down. Just click, hit it once right here. Not 100. Well, there we go. 3.1. That's a half a degree. Methane matters. Nitrous oxide matters from agriculture. F gases, the Kigali Agreement. These matter a lot. It's a full half a degree. You're right, sir. It's a big deal. You got a tip from the professor from Argentina. Okay. What else? What else is needed? Yes, ma'am. Pricing carbon. Pricing carbon, citizen climate lobby, many others, 22% of global emissions today are covered by a carbon price. That's a lot around the world, but they're not very high. What if we add price to carbon? So you click under carbon price and you can see this is the kind of basic view. Underneath, if you hit the three dots, 
you're going to see many more things that can be changed, like a specific carbon price. Anyone have a dream carbon price? When you said it, you thought of $100 a ton, 90 cents on a gallon of gas in the United States, $100 a ton. Run your mental math. Here we are. We've gotten down to 3.1. We're going to have $100 a ton. We've already reduced methane. We haven't touched all of that fossil fuel emissions. $100 a ton. Killian, what do you think? What do you think? 3.1? Let's try it. 2.5. Wow. What a big difference. As a system dynamicist, that's the field that built this model. We call ourselves system dynamicists. Dynamics as in the timing of things, behavior over time. Invented at MIT Sloan in the 1950s. Dynamics matter. The dynamics, what decade did a trillion trees and new zero carbon energy like thorium fission help to this problem in what decade? 2050, 2060. What decade does a carbon price implemented soon help? Then we, it, we, we ramped it in over 10 years. Look at it again. Maybe go all the way up here, if you would, just show us the line again. You can't see it as well here. Uh, just the line graph. It starts helping like next Tuesday. Look at that. Why? When you price fossil fuels and you discourage them and their direct use, you get less utilization of the existing capacity. You don't wait for the competition to push it out. You just say, we're going to burn less coal, oil, and gas by putting a price on carbon. It is very effective. One of the reasons that it hasn't happened in the United States, because we have such powerful interests that don't want to stop burning coal, oil, and gas starting next Tuesday. This is why there's such a huge resistance to this policy in so many places where you have an industry as powerful as the fossil fuel industry that can just stop a lot because they have tremendous power with our elected officials, with our government, with our people, with the media that frankly get us to think that things like a trillion trees are gonna save us. So that's the bad news. The good news is, holy cow, would this be effective? What a great suggestion. A carbon price could really bring down those emissions really fast. The other thing is that it has a challenge that has a benefit and is bad for equity. If we have a carbon price, what happens to the prices of energy? What happens to the price of energy? Let's go check it out. Uh-oh. This is very challenging. If you cut the supply, basic supply and demand economics says costs, the price goes up. It's that same loop I showed you before. Remember I told you there was a price demand feedback loop before we had uh, demand go down? No, it was price went down and demand went up. And this is going the other direction. What we have here is expensive energy. And so what happens to demand? What happens to demand? The benefit of this is that there's a secondary effect. If energy is a little more expensive, overall energy consumption goes down. There is an incentive to turn off the lights and do conservation, invest in much more efficient motors and energy efficiency, performance standards, et cetera. However, I said, uh-oh, when I saw that first cost of energy because of the equity problems. People in lower income communities spend a larger percentage of their income on energy. How do people drive and get to work? How do they pay the electricity bill? When the cost of energy, if you go over to the cost of energy, went up that much. There are proposals, maybe we can dividend the revenue. There's a lot of revenue, dividend back to people. But this is one of the equity challenges that we see. And one of the reasons that it hasn't passed as well is that we need to address equity and climate together. And the cost of energy is one of the important considerations. That said, I gave you a challenge and it was to get to well below two degrees. You have cut methane, nitrous oxide and F gases. You have set a carbon price. 
you're at 2.5 degrees C. You want to do better. What else shall we do? Yes, sir, in the back. Oil. Minimizing oil. Great idea. Let's go up and see how we did with oil. Primary energy of oil. In this scenario, with a carbon price that we took a big dent, it would have done this. Now it's basically flattened. Let's think about some of the things that can cut oil demand. Already, we have improvements in energy efficiency in the transportation sector. We can do better with public transportation, with land use planning that optimizes public transportation, with more efficient vehicles and shipping and trucking, et cetera. Yazzie, let's crank that up most much of the way. Energy efficiency and transport, what do? Run it a few more times. It takes it from flat to down, flat to down. And look at, we get a little closer to following the NDCs and temperature comes down to 2.4. That's really good. What's the other thing that would complement efficiency that happens to be a big part of the Inflation Reduction Act? Hint, there's $7,500 associated with this policy in the US. If you purchase one of these, electric vehicles. So. The big beauty of this is if you decarbonize and electrify, you ship from oil to lower carbon sources. So maybe let's just we open it up, Yazzie, and we're going to see for electrification, a fairly modest future for electrification right now. What if we crank up electrification road and rail to say 80%? This is the dream around the world of 80% and Big dent there. You see, it went from falling somewhat to falling much more steeply. I just want to talk about the international geopolitical benefits of this as well. What would life be like around the world if we weren't so dependent on petro states in order to run our energy system? This is a more secure world as well as a much better warming world. So that helped a good bit. Let's get lucky as well on road and rail. No, no, on um, air and water down here. What if we electrified there? This is dreaming a bit. It might take a while, but we could electrify more there, maybe go to 50. And then notice we get this electrification up a little more. Okay, we're here at 2.3 degrees. We had some new people come in. If you're just coming by and you just came in, uh, again, we are climate interactive. We work closely with MIT Sloan on this simulator, En-ROADS, which is freely available to you. You can go try it yourself, 18 languages. And we actually have a course. If you would want to do what I'm doing right now, we've trained 500. You're nodding. You like this. You want to do this? You used to be a science teacher. Perfect. Pull up the course if you would. So science teachers, change agents alike, there is a free online course to go learn how to stand on a stage and be a salesman for their climate future like I'm doing right now. Walk people through this systems model. So it's on the Climate Interactive website, Mastering En-ROADS. It's free. Go learn how to do it. Become like Killian and Eduardo, one of the world's climate ambassadors, En-ROADS climate ambassadors. That's what they're doing. This is many of them, 582 around the world, freely available in 18 languages. But we're not done. What are we, 2.3? Are we at 2.3, Yazzie? 2.3, what if we? All right, everyone. I'm gonna pause it right there. Um, we can keep watching, but we're also running against the top of the hour. So I know many of you all are busy people and need to try and do the next thing in your day. I uh, just wanted to say thank you all so much for joining. Um, what we were just watching was the event just held at, at the U.S. Center 
at COP27, the UN climate change negotiations happening currently in Egypt. Uh, you saw our team, uh, Drew Jones and Yasmin Zahar there on stage, uh, sharing inroads with the audience there. I know there was a question about who is in the audience and the, that event uh, is op was open to people who had access to what's called the blue zone at uh, the, the climate talk. So registered observers, like uh, when we show up, we're a, a nonprofit. Um, there are business representatives there. There are government representatives and lots and lots of journalists. So it was probably a mix of people. Um, they could just walk by and sit down in the room and uh, listen to the presentation. Uh, that was going on. So I hope you all enjoyed that. Um, and like I said, we will keep watching and uh, see if they do are successful in getting well below two degrees. Um, but if you need to run, you need to run. Um, also, I will say we're going to send out the recording of this webinar afterwards. So if you wanted to watch or use the material in the webinar uh, for presentations or classes or whatever, we will send that uh, afterwards. So look for the email tomorrow or the next day uh, for that. But I'm going to turn it back over to Drew and let's see how they do on, uh, on the scenario. Done. We got a high carbon price, energy efficiency transport. We've electrified, we've cut methane. We're at 2.3 degrees, we wanna get below two. What else needs to be done in the package? What else needs to be done? Call it out really loudly if you have an idea. Actually, you know what? I'm not gonna ask anymore, we're just gonna do this. Because I've run this a few times before and I know the answer. Buildings and industry, performance standards, insulation, these are things that cut costs for people. These are things that address inequity around the world because people have a better quality of life and they save money if we invest in energy efficiency, motors, performance standards, buildings, et cetera. Watch what happens here to the overall demand for energy. Crank that up. It goes down a little bit more. We don't need as much energy. We're still at 2.3, but we're right on the edge towards 2.2. Let's electrify heat pumps a part of the inflation reduction act we use the emergency funding i don't remember what it was called exactly in order to get the money to get them around the world get them to europe to be free from russian oil and gas for gas all right electrification buildings and industry now we're all the way down to two degrees what else we haven't addressed deforestation right now Food demand and other interests are leading us to high levels of deforestation, Brazil, Indonesia, and around the world. Food matters. We already cut nitrous oxide. That helped us. What if we cut deforestation some more? Let's crank it all the way down to zero. This is part of the big pledge in Glasgow last year. It helps. Did you notice? Run it again. You can see the overall emissions come down just a little bit more. It's not a silver bullet. It helps, however. What else shall we be doing? Crank up renewables a little bit more and increase the carbon price. $100 a ton just isn't going to do it. We want to get below two degrees. 1.9. All right, give yourself a hand. 1.9 degrees. We want to keep 1.5 alive. 1.5 is very challenging in a scientifically grounded simulation model. We can keep playing and I can show you what it takes. Often it takes some carbon removal methods that frankly, we don't know are gonna work, but we could test them. But what I wanna do is just step back for a second and consider what did we just do here? There's no silver bullet. There's no silver bullet. There are all these booths with people with their solutions. Sometimes it feels like it's this election. Who's going to win the election for the most important bullet? What we're doing is we're putting together combinations of actions across the board in many different sectors that together can succeed at keeping warming 
below two degrees. Bill McKibben said, there's no silver bullet. There is silver buckshot. It's a very American word. Buckshot, many actions together. Third, what is the priority? The priority of what helped the most were things that kept us from burning coal, oil, and gas. Climate change is caused primarily by burning coal, oil, and gas. And the way to prevent it, the most high leverage way, is to do that less. Less burning coal, oil, and gas. The other two, methane and deforestation. Fourth, it is still possible. We can prevent many of the worst scenarios for the future. The scientists have been saying it. I hope you just discovered that. But I want you to see how much better it would be. Let's pull up some of the impacts here. Let's pull up sea level rise right around here. Climate Central are some partners of ours, and they gave us connection to their amazing maps. You may have seen this, these amazing maps from Climate Central, where they map sea level rise. This is right near Alexandria. And, you know, Yazzie, th this works. You can actually do it this way. Hit the, the redo button. Oh, wait, wait. Actually, it won't work on this. It's, it's so slow. Never mind. Pardon me. The blue areas are at risk from flooding no matter what, even in a 3.6 degree scenario, in a 1.9 degree scenario. However, the green areas are saved by the mitigation actions that you just took. So all of this land would have been underwater from flooding, but is now not underwater because of less warming, less sea level rise, therefore these areas not flooded. That's remarkable. Now we actually know some of these benefits. How about biodiversity? Under a 3.6 degree future, you could make it really big. Mammals, 27% of species of mammals lose more than half of their climatic range. Mammals live in certain temperature areas. If it gets warmer, they can't move to a new area. However, in a 1.9 degree future, that goes all the way down, excuse me, to eight, 27 to eight. Insects, 55 to 17. Plants, 50 to 16. Huge benefits here. Let's look at crop yield and deaths from extreme heat. There are many other huge benefits to all the mitigation actions you just took. Under that baseline, 21% decrease in crop yield from maize, feeding people around the world, goes down to nine, a much better future. Additional deaths from extreme heat in different parts of the world. Because of the amazing 1.5 special report from the IPCC, we learned of a lot of the research about the distinction between three degrees-ish and 1.9 and 1.5. Southeast Asia, additional deaths from extreme heat goes from 9% down to three and a half percent. Significant improvements, a much, much better world. We also see other impacts. What was the one I didn't show there? Air pollution. Okay, yeah, before you pull it up, oh, there it is. That's good. We talked about equity before. What I told you before is we want to address climate and equity together. So when we thought about afforestation, we think, who lives on the land that is required for these plantations before we were thinking about? Important question. When we had a carbon price, we asked, what happens to energy prices, particularly in lower income communities? Now we get to do what we call multi-solve. Co-founder Beth Sawin, co-founder of Climate Interactive, founded the sustainability, excuse me, the multi-solving institute and coined the term multi-solving, when there's an action that has multiple benefits. We're at a point where we need those kind of interventions that solve multiple problems at the same time. If we address climate, and one of the powerful ways we do it is by cutting coal, look what happens to emissions of PM 2.5. These are the small particulates implicated in cardiovascular disease, 
lung disease, asthma. These kinds of emissions are implicated in one in 10 deaths around the world. What would it do in this kind of future? Would it not get worse at the same at the same rate, but maybe get a little bit better? No. It gets like so, so much better. PM 2.5 emissions goes way, way, way down. Think of New Delhi, think of Beijing, think of all the suffering from air quality. This is a co-benefit of taking action to this degree to address climate change. Okay. Put it all together. Put it all together at this big scenario. No silver bullet. There was silver buckshot. It's still possible. We kept coal, oil, and gas in the ground. We cut methane and deforestation. And we looked for the co-benefits that could address equity at the same time. Overall, getting on a path to making this happen isn't going to be easy. It's going to be worth it. Thank you very much. Give it up to the flyer here, Yasmin Zahar. Again, the simulator is available in 18 languages. Go to the top right there, 18 languages. Go Google En-ROADS, it's free. The training is free, use it. Right now we're using it in banks, in middle schools, in governments, in Africa, in Asia, around the world. Actually, pull up that map if you would, Yazzie. The people have self-reported running events in all of these spots. If you run an event, let us know. We'll put you on the map. We have some time for questions. Do we do, we do the questions here, don't we, Andrew? We have a mic for them? Why not? Why not? There's, well, that, there's a ready hand right there. She'd like to ask a question. Go ahead, ma'am. That no, that was a fantastic presentation. Your enthusiasm Thanks. was was phenomenal, especially at six o'clock. So kudos to all to both of you for the energy. You didn't touch the what is that? The what what is this? My my right hand. The the bottom right about carbon removal, which is central for a lot of the current discussions. It really is. So it and you, really is. Yeah, I didn't miss the fact that you said there's a lot of things that we don't know whether they're gonna work or not. Um, how do you we played with the forest? Yeah, let's do it. Let's how, do it. How, does, how do you account let's for go technology? Let's create a different a different tab. Here we are starting from scratch. Open up carbon removal. Afforestation is one approach. I already <laughs> tore that one up. There are five different types of carbon removal that we're uh, learning about and we've added. I was over there at the oceans area learning about ocean fertilization. Google came to me and they said, add it. It's a silver bullet. You got to add it. There are even more. But the five that we've considered, bioenergy, carbon capture and storage, burn trees, not good. Capture as much of the carbon as you can. Shove it underground. Direct air capture. They're like these dehumidifiers. You plug them in. They use a lot of energy. They pull carbon out of the atmosphere. You pipe it. You shove it underground. Number three, crush up rocks, enhance mineralization, spread it on agricultural land. It absorbs carbon. Number four, agriculture soil carbon. Some co-benefits to this. Don't till your soil as much. More carbon stays in the soil. And biochar is the fifth. The Royal Society did a study, 2019 greenhouse gas report. They estimated how much might we get of all these things. So we can test that. Move it up to 100%. Don't move anything yet, but you could move it up and test. How do we want to test it? Let's get the stacked graph here on the right of greenhouse gas net emissions, and we can see them. And on the left, if you go to the thumbnails, Yazzie, and then get the net removals. So this is gonna show how much gets pulled out of the atmosphere if we have technological carbon removal. Okay, there's the setup. Which kind do you like? No preference, pick one. What kind does somebody else like? Biochar, biochar. This is the one I understand the least. You grow trees, 
you do this chemical process that turns into a kind of a charcoal and then spread it on the on the on the land and it pulls carbon out of the atmosphere so with something like this we don't just say here is the future of biochar that's not our strength we know the implications on temperature so we're going to go to assumptions and go look because i don't remember what the royal society said roll scroll down to royal society said in for uh carbon removal carbon dioxide removal maximum and here we are and if you click on the little triangle by the way all of the sources we put in here go read the papers there is that royal society greenhouse gas removal they said 3.5 gigatons is the middle point of their estimate so what if we got as much as the royal society think is possible now mind you you've been playing with this model for 55 minutes and your mental model i hope is a lot better because if it's a lot better, you can say, wait, that says 3.5. This says 60. So we're putting 60 in and pulling 3.5 is a little bit out. It's not that much. So 3.6 goes, where do you think it's going to go? It's going to stay. It's not even going to move it down to put 3.5. Wow, let's try it. So 100% of the biochar potential, 100, and then up, oh, it gets us 0.1, okay? Now notice, play it, play it, the replay again. See that silver area? That's those removals. That's the biochar. Add in the direct air capture that they think is possible. It's seeming now we're gonna get more than this on the, on the direct air capture, but here it comes. Here comes the direct air capture. We're up to five gigatons removal. That is five relative to 80. Without huge mitigation, carbon removal is insignificant and probably a, not a wise use of our precious funds. Now, mind you, Yazzie, give us 1.9 again. She's going to throw in the carbon price and all that stuff. In a world where we take on the hard work of cutting coal, oil, gas, methane, and deforestation, okay, I will allow, it would be great to get from 1.9 to 1.8. Because I think that's what we're talking about, isn't it? Here we are at 1.9. As if you add in that other carbon removal, or you could probably just, yeah, add it back in and then we get from 1.9 down to 1.8. In that kind of scenario, I get it. Not a priority, not a priority. What's the priority? Coal, oil, gas, methane, deforestation. Absent significant work, and we know how hard it is to cut those emissions given the power of those industries. Well, the coal, oil, and gas, the fossil fuel industry in particular, after we do that work, not after, but if we succeed at that, it really makes sense with some carbon removal. But there is some danger here, friends. The danger would be distraction by some of these lower leverage actions that are just not a top priority. I showed you afforestation. I told you research and development. Wait, someday we'll come up with a silver bullet. Now I'm showing you some in carbon removal. There are co-benefits to the agricultural soil carbon work. That could be kind of powerful. Thank you for your good question. We have two more minutes. Yes, sir. Thank you. This is brilliant and really useful tool. So I guess my question is more on the general philosophical framing here, because this is very much, in my view, linked to this geomechanical understanding of the earth not necessarily a living systems view where it's like if we just tinker with the engine and slide it like this the earth like a machine would respond like that uh -huh. which is, runs very different from indigenous cosmogenies and other ways of looking at it may not be as scientific Interesting. Um, but yeah I'm, I'm curious if we were to bring that down to something a little bit more concrete and thinking about our ecological crisis as a crisis of our ecology primarily yeah. rather than just like atmospheric gases that we have to mechanically reduce my my fear in 
having it be done in this worldview is that we then make decisions based off of these metrics that are anti our living systems. Interesting. So, you know, biomass uh, plantations or things that are theoretically good for that number on that top right, but bad for the actual health and vitality of the ecosystems. I'm just curious how you yeah. respond to that. This is interesting. I love this question about what is the worldview that we bring to this? What is the paradigm? And there are so many, there's a mechanistic, frankly, this grew out of electrical engineering. You can tell, right? That's how we built the model. The whole method grew out of that field at MIT, a mechanistic view of A causes B causes C, et cetera. There are other worldviews, a systems worldview, a more ecological worldview that really appreciates more deeply the interdependence of living systems. How would we address this challenge from that perspective? I love this second worldview. And I'll just say, we forget this for a second. And just for a moment, some of the, that worldview leading to the same conclusion. And the same conclusion here is there's this carbon dioxide that took millions of years to get underground. It needs to stay underground. End of the first part. We need to care for ecological systems and the actions that are best will improve the health of the overall ecological systems. If we just really embrace those two ideas, we're going to do about as well as we could. We would stop burning coal, oil, and gas, and we would restore ecosystems, handling deforestation, methane, et cetera. So that's another path to the same sort of insight. I love ending with paradigms. I love ending with the paradigms, and I love ending, because guess what? You guys have been working for two weeks. This is the final event. You guys stand up and you guys in the back, give a hand for these guys. How many events did you guys run? Holy cow. No, really stand up. Andrew, you stand up. Gary and your team, thank you to the U.S. Center for convening a conversation. It had to be an incredible amount of work. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. One more time for Andrew and Yasmin. Woohoo! Thank you guys. And that concludes the U.S. Center at COP27. Come back next year. <laughs> All right. Thanks for everyone who stayed. Ellie just got muted again. Oh, sorry. Uh, that was fun to watch. Just even sit it, sitting there, see it, seeing our team over there, uh, getting to engage so many people. Uh, thank you all. Thanks for uh, all the good comments on chat and everything. And uh, let's uh, let's get out there and we'll sh drive all those climate conversations and see how much we can we can make a difference on this big big challenge. Thanks for all the work that you all are doing. Take care and have a good day. Thanks everyone for joining. If there are any more questions, go to support.climbinteractive.org. Have a great day.